My name is Sandra Palin, and I'm sorry that I'm losing my voice. It's not always like this, but I have, I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I have two distinct privileges as attached to this conference. One is to work with the organizing committee, and the other is to introduce Professor John Burroughs as our keynote speaker this afternoon. His topic is Reconciliation and Refusal, Comparison, Contrast, and Multiple Stories. Professor Burroughs is an Aboriginal scholar and a lawyer specializing in indige indi sorry, Indigenous legal rights and comparative constitutional law. He earned his BA, MA, Juris Doctor, and Master of Laws from the University of Toronto, and a PhD from Osgoode Hall Law School, and a Doctor of Laws from Dalhousie University with honors. He teaches in the area of constitutional, indigenous, and environmental law, and is the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria. <laughs> Professor Burroughs has received many awards in, for his research and writing, and to name but a few, he is the recipient of, the, of a Trudeau Foundation Fellowship in 2006, the Indigenous Peoples Council from the Indigenous Bar Association for Honor and Integrity and Service to Indigenous Communities in 2012, and as mentioned earlier today, the 2017 National Killam Prize, Prize, which was just announced last week. And to quote from that announcement, it says, John Boros is bringing about one of the quiet revolutions in our history, restoring Indigenous law to its place alongside Canadian common law for his substantial and distinguished scholarship and commitment to furthering our knowledge about Indigenous legal traditions, John Boros, holder of, the Canada Re holder of the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria, was named the 2017 Killam Prize winner in Social Sciences Today in Ottawa by the Canada Council for the Arts. Professor Boros has published four books on Indigenous constitutional law, including The Resurgence of Indigenous Law in 2002, Drawing Out Law, A Spirit's Guide in 2010, Canada's Indigenous Constitution in 2011, and Freedom and Indigenous Constitutionalism in 2015. His work has influenced the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples. John is a Anishinaabe Ojibwe and a member of the Chippewa of Nawash First Nation in Ontario. He and his fun and supportive wife, Kim, live in Victoria. They have two daughters, one of which is autistic, and the other is currently in bar admissions in Victoria and is following in her dad's footsteps. It was in Toronto about 20 years ago that our paths crossed for the first time. We worked together as volunteers in support of youth. And I reported to him, and the thing that I was most impressed about with John at that time was his humility. My esteem for him has grown over the years, not just because of his immense accomplishment, but because of his understanding and acceptance of different perspectives. Clear, articulate, and never argumentative, John is deeply committed to the conversation. So it's my pleasure to now turn the time over to Professor Boros. Miigwech, abuju ne dinawe magani dok, ni jianishnabek, ni chmarzik, bangiet to go in a ta nishnabem, and gaguji tun jishtamoyan. Giganos and Dijnikas, Ne Ashi and Igaming and Donjaba, Nigigan Dodem. Nuitish and Don Chanakanagawan Nungum. Miigwech Biajayag Nungum. I'm delighted to be able to introduce myself in the language that flows from this land. This is Anishinaabemwin, it's an Algonquian speaking language, and the words and sounds are found in the ecology of this place. And as I stand here, I'm celebrating the return of spring as slow as that might be. <laughs> and I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have to be able to gather and talk about this important issue. Spring is a time of gathering for the Anishinaabe people. Uh, we would be in small family groups in isolated settings for most of the winter 
as we tried to brave the cold and the darkness. And then when the sap started to run in the trees, as the maple trees were getting ready for the change of season, the Anishinaabe would tap that sap and boil it down. And so we would start to gather together in larger groups. This now being the end of that season, there would be a further gathering and uh, people would come together in extended family groups from across hundreds and hundreds of miles and in that gathering uh, celebrate the return of many beautiful things that we have so much to be thankful for in this world. Our practice at this season was to feast and in Anishinaabe when the word for feast is we konge. Uh, the word for feast is the same word as the word for invitation. A feast is an invitation. It's a celebration of an appreciation as we have this return together as family, as we have this return together of all of our relations. Uh, we will watch as in the next uh, few weeks we'll gather the thunderers that uh, Douglas talked about, Anamaki Ka, as they return uh, from the south and uh, spread their energy across this land. We'll see the gathering of the birds, B'nai Siyag, as they come from their various locales and uh, bring the joy of song back to our territories and all its rich diversity. We also have the gathering again and the return and the new life of the insects. The word for insect in Anishinaabemwin is manedu shen sak. Our word for the creator is gijem manedu or gichi manedu. The creator is uh, the compassionate one, gijem manedu or gichi manedu, the great spirit. And uh, these little insects are manedu shen sak. Um, they bring that uh, sense of joy and wonder that we feel when we think about the Creator and all that He has provided. And I always like that thought of their return and their gathering at this season. This season is called Ziguan. Um, it's, uh, it's the time when things start to flow and start to run. And then the later spring is called Manokme which is the good earth season when the earth then starts to prepare to grow so much around it. Um, we also have the bears that come out of their dens and the turtles and uh, we watch the, uh, the, the, the light and the heat lengthen. And in each of these instances, in each of these events are teachings about how to live in celebration how to live in joy, how to live with one another in peaceful and orderly ways. And much of my career has been spent in drawing out law from these cases or these stories or these principles and these processes that are found around us. For Anishinaabe people, to learn the law is to read the earth and to learn a literacy that analogizes from what is around us in nature and try to think about how we can apply that in our daily lives. Um, so it's a good thing to be gathered here today and to think about all the beauties that we've been given that uh, we have an opportunity to share with one another. I want in my brief time that I have with you today to stick to the theme of this conference. We've been given a think piece paper and I want to exercise a little bit of discipline in going through some of my thoughts in relationship to this paper. Um, and then I hopefully at the end will return to some of those meta metaphorical uh, aspects uh, that I so love and would spend most of my life talking about and living if I could. But a question that's animating this conference is whether our religious and secular diversity can be a resource for acting together. And I believe that it can. And I want to describe why I believe this can be the case. As I've mentioned, I'm a Anishinaabe. I'm a member of the Chippewa of the Nawash First Nation on the shores of Georgian Bay on the Bruce Peninsula. I'm also a son of a British immigrant who left England after the Second World War. 
Furthermore, I'm a law professor, as been said, and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria. And I'm also a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a Mormon. I joined this church when I was 18, and I've been grateful for my faith through these intervening years. My life is marked by these influences, indigenous, immigrant, secular, and religious. I belong to multiple communities. I acknowledge that these experiences are narrow, as anyone's life must be, but nevertheless, I want to draw on these experiences to address this day's theme because I think they illustrate the necessity of being open to difference and seeing resources for acting together in those differences. In so doing, I want to echo Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's counsel to beware the danger of the single story. In my talk, I want to ensure that we do not oversimplify our similarities and our differences. And I believe that comparison and contrast is a key to this endeavor. The juxtaposition of our stories can assist us in welcoming diverse perspectives into public spaces. And comparison can reveal where there are gaps and misunderstandings which might have been overemphasized or undervalued in our relationships. In this regard, I like the insight from uh, Kirster Stendhal. Before he passed away, he was the Lutheran Bishop of Stockholm, and he was a professor at Harvard Divinity School. He established three rules for religious understanding that you may have heard of. First, when you are trying to understand another religion, you should ask the adherents of that religion and not its enemies. Secondly, we should not compare our best to their worst. And third, we should leave room for holy envy by finding elements in other faiths that we wish to emulate. I believe these insights should be broadly construed they should be applied to people who are not only religious, but to people who consider themselves secular and those who regard themselves as being um, not religious, but spiritual. Stendhal's perspective can help us build trust between people as it lays, I think, the groundwork for joint action. Comparing and contrasting our perspectives in this way can I think take us beyond simple toleration. A favorable contrast can be an important tool for strengthening civic engagement. Uh, philosopher Charles Taylor also talks in this same language. He develops the idea of vocabularies of comparison or perspicuous contrast. Um, this is a way of understanding others that tries to understand people from their own internal uh, views and then compare on that basis. For me, this is the path of learning uh, because it reveals where our own ethnocentricities may get in the way of understanding in both our private and our public lives. Now, as we apply these methodologies, we must not assume that all voices have equal access to the public sphere. Some religious and secular commitments are tied to greater economic, social, and cultural power. That is not all tweets, posts, and articles, and expressions are created equally. And I think we see this power imbalance in our own history at the time of Confederation, Canada was predominantly a Christian country. Most citizens with this belief and this spirituality um, found great joy and guidance in that, but it also became a vehicle to exclude others from fellow citizenship and mainstream society. As we've heard this morning eloquently, Aboriginal peoples were indoctrinated 
in residential schools and their views were marginalized. Uh, Jewish people faced significant discrimination in freely structuring their affairs in this country. Uh, people from Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean were denied entry to this land. All places where Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism, other religions prevailed at the time. Unfortunately, many of these same racial, religious, and ethnic uh, discriminatory practices are still with us today and they act in a cancerous way. At the same time, we are also one of the most diverse societies in the world. As Canada changes, this diversity is slowly changing how power is exercised, and this is a good thing, as heretofore excluded groups are given greater opportunities for participating in framing our national stories. We have so much to learn from one another and I think this enriches us greatly. But there are challenges in how we proceed, in addition to the power imbalances that I've been talking about when it comes to diversity. When it comes to where we are now, there's another danger of placing one kind of exclusivity with another kind of exclusivity. As the Framing paper in this conference reveals in the last few decades an emerging framework for promoting social unity has been an exclusive secularism. Some versions of this story try to banish religious, religious expression and practice from the public sphere. And if we're not careful, secularism can trap us in the danger of a single story. If taken to extremes or viewed as a paramount value, it can banish vocabularies of comparison from public life. When this occurs, secularism can lead to another kind of partiality. It can be used in ways that are inattentive to its own power. In these moments, secularism can marginalize certain groups and points of view. I see this danger in the Supreme Court of Canada's choice to advance state neutrality when it comes to matters of religion and conscience. I do not believe that neutrality, this framework, is a realistic approach to adjudicate the diversity that we experience. Neutrality requires adherence to a particular worldview one that believes neutrality is possible. In fact, as I've been saying, the invocation of so-called neutrality can blind us to its own exclusivity and political potency. The enactment of neutrality requires an act of faith related to decision-making and human reasoning that is not supported in fact or theory. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada itself, in another context, has recognized the impossibility of neutrality. In a case called the Queen versus RDS, in dealing with judicial judgment and whether or not judges themselves can be neutral, has this to say. And I'm going to quote at some length because it's key to my thesis in questioning this idea of neutrality. So, quote, the court says in RDS, it is necessary to distinguish between the impartiality which is required of all judges and the concept of judicial neutrality. The distinction we would draw is that reflected in the insightful words of Benjamin Cardozo, where he affirmed the, affirmed the importance of impartiality while at the same time recognizing the fallacy of judicial neutrality. And then he says, and the court quotes what Cardoso says, there is in each of us a stream of tendency, whether you call it a philosophy or not, which gives coherence and direction to thought and action. Judges cannot escape that current any more than mere mortals. All their lives, forces which they do not recognize and cannot name have been tugging at them. Inherited instincts, 
traditional beliefs, acquired convictions, and the resultant is an outlook on life, a conception of social needs. In this mental background, every problem finds its setting. We may try to see things as objectively as we please. Nonetheless, we can never see them with any eyes except our own. Goes on, deep below consciousness are other forces, the likes and dislikes, the predilections and prejudices, the complex of instincts, emotions, and habits and convictions, which makes the person, whether he or she be a litigant or a judge. That's the end of Cardozo, and then the court keeps quoting. Cardozo recognized that objectivity was an impossibility because judges, like all other human beings, operate from their own perspectives. As the Canadian Judicial Council noted in its commentaries on judicial conduct, and like the quote then, court then quotes from them, there's no human being who is not the product of every social experience, every process of education, and every human contact. What is possible and desirable, they note, is impartiality. The wisdom required of a judge is to recognize, consciously allow for, and perhaps question all the baggage of past attitudes and sympathies that fellow citizens are free to carry to the grave. And then the court now finishes its quote here. True impartiality does not require that the judge have no sympathy or opinions. It requires that the judge nevertheless be free to entertain and act upon different points of view with an open mind, end quote. So since judges here recognize that neutrality is impossible in their own work, I fail to see how this is a helpful approach in dealing with religious and or secular matters. If judges cannot reach this fabled state, I also think we should reject neutrality's false premises. It's a single story facade. It hides as much as it reveals. Fortunately, as I've been suggesting, the rejection of neutrality does not leave us adrift. We do not have to be at the mercy of any particular or general religious or secular approach in making decisions in the public sphere. I've been arguing that we need to make our viewpoints more explicit rather than less so. They need to be expressed and acted upon more powerfully in the public sphere. This is the path of education and public life. Rather than pretending that any one single solution or label will magically absolve us from having to make judgments in the public life. So with this myth of neutrality in the open, if you agree with me, I will now explore ways in which our diversity can be a resource to bring differing views into the open. My claim in making these arguments is not that my perspectives are endpoints for making public judgments. They, of course, must be weighed and balanced. And judgments about their usefulness be given in light of contrasting and comparing views. They must be placed beside other ideas and practices different from my own if they are to yield insight and pathways to action. Any resources for action generated within the perspectives offered, offered therefore should not be conflated with a particular course of action. I'm just merely trying to indicate that resources exist within and across varied perspectives. And as I do this, I hope you will also think about the challenge of avoiding single-storied labels. So first of all, as I talk about Indigenous and immigration, secular and religious, Indigenous, as I mentioned, the outset of my talk, I'm a Anishinaabe, and my mother immersed me in her love of our land. I was just home these past couple of days on the Bruce Peninsula, and uh, 
the joy in her eyes was palpable as she was hearing the songs of the birds return. Uh, her love of the land has structured how I look at the world around me. And this structuring has led to my lifelong involvement in trying to understand Anishinaabe law. Anishinaabe law encourages vocabularies of comparison. Contrast is present in our stories, and it's particularly given prominence in the stories we tell about our trickster figure, Nanabush. This trickster engages in behaviors which are simultaneously kind and mean, charming and cunning, selfless and selfish, sometimes even in the same moment. Telling stories about the trickster encourages listeners to see themselves in his actions. Because we can likewise embody these same contrasting qualities. Kindness, meanness, selfishness, selflessness, charming and cunning. We are the trickster. Trickster stories help us see where there are gaps, misunderstandings, and incongruencies in our behaviors as we see ourselves in his actions. And of course, the trickster is a transformer too. And there's aspects of that which introduce comparison and contrast in our ways of legal reasoning. Vocabularies of comparison are also present in Anishinaabe thought through the structure of our language. Anishinaabemoen, which I spoke at the beginning, it's an Algonquian language, it's a verb-centered language. 75% of the language structure is devoted to action. Nouns do not dominate. So fixed categories of persons, places, or things do not control thought. Fluidity marks the language. It is hard to be caught in frozen categories or singular descriptions. The use of verbs, as you know, lends itself to comparison. You build words from verb stems, which cause you to work with analogies and distinctions. You can always modify these words through endless prefixes and suffixes. Um, for example, we have at least 10 pronouns in our language. Neen, geen, ween, ninawind, geenawind, geenawa, weenawa, awan, wan. These are I, you, he, she, we inclusive, we exclusive, you all, they all, um, our relatives, and then we even have descriptors for a fourth person in a conversation and a fifth person in a conversation. These pronouns mean there's no word order in Ojibwe because you mark who's speaking or being spoken about by the marking of the pronouns. And this puts us into constantly shifting relationships with one another. Furthermore, our nouns are marked by animacy and inanimacy. Rocks are living in Anishinaabemowin. A Cree student of mine, Danica Littlechild, spoke about water as living. Now, Cree is a closely related Algonquian language. It's very close to Anishinaabemowin. And she wrote in her master's thesis, Nipi is the Cree word for water. Ni derives from Nia, meaning I or I am. Pi derives from the word pamatsuin, meaning life. Nipi is thus properly understood as meaning I am life. Water is lifeblood in Cree. She says, animating us as human beings and all that is around us. The Cree language operates on the principle of anima, life force. Understanding that elements of ourselves and our environment have an inner life force determines how those elements are described, usually in a relational manner. Water is much a process as it is an entity. Water has many identities in our language, she says. Over 40 words or phrases in Cree describe water in all its forms and manifestation. Water is a living cultural and spiritual entity that defies reduction to a mere resource. Think about the resources for reasoning 
public action that's found in this descriptor. And the point I'm making is that when indigenous thought is placed in comparison with other viewpoints, we may find significant opportunity and resources for making decision. We may benefit from considering the living nature of the earth and waters. We may gain something from understanding the fluidity of personhood as drawn from languages which are indigenous to the territories we call home. You may be aware in New Zealand, the parliament there has recently enacted legislation recognizing the Whanganui River as being a living being. It has representation in the law. Just as we're familiar with corporations in Canadian law having legal personality, now rivers in that country have a personality that has to be protected. Likewise, in India, uh, the Ganges has been recognized as being a living being on its own, not through legislation in that instance, but through common law interpretation. So that's one category to think about making more explicit in our conversations rather than trying to hide it under labels of neutrality. The second category of immigrant. As mentioned, I am the son of a British immigrant who left England after the Second World War. He did so to escape the ravages of class-based privilege and social control. My dad grew up in a small town in Yorkshire. He also passed along to me a love for that country, though I did not know much about his childhood until my later years, about 10 years ago, in fact. While from an Anishinaabe perspective, it may seem like Canada is dominated by the English, this is not the case always from an English immigrant's perspective. Now there is no doubt that my father experienced significant advantages coming to this country when compared with those from non-English speaking places. Linguistically, politically, and socially, there were similarities that made his transition easier than some others. At the same time, not all English or English speaking people are the same. We need to remember the diversity in the immigrant population, no matter which country we're talking about, even if they come from the same country. So he came from a working class coal mining town, Barnsley, which has been described uh, by Rudyard Kipling uh, when he was alive as the dirtiest place in England. It was a coal mining town that was just filthy. Furthermore, when my father arrived here, he experienced discrimination. He was frequently called a DP, a displaced person. Uh, he heard, more often than he would care to uh, admit, uh, people telling him to go back to where he came from. His dialect also marked him as different. Um, when he was in England, uh, he suffered from um, the family and social traumas which are a part of war. Bombs were dropped around his home. He remembers thousands of bombers flying overhead for hours. Bodies would often litter the streets, and his parents were virtually absent as they were fighting for their lives. Now, my father's experience in immigration and others like him from varied backgrounds around the world provide resources for public action. Their stories must be continually added to, no matter where they come from, to our stock of story as Canadians, as each wave of peoples and individuals join our society. Um, they illustrate that we are not one people, ethnically speaking, as Canadians. Uh, we are one in the broadest sense as humans, entitled to be treated with dignity and respect, uh, but we need to be careful not to oversimplify that story. Now, I have not had the experience of war and resettlement. I've learned this secondhand from my father. But there are people among us who have had this direct experience, and I expect some in this room. If we do not learn from them by comparing and contrasting our viewpoints, we lose valuable insights about how to structure our public life. Third category secular. 
I also think we have much to learn from secular approaches to public action. They are a part, that is secularism, is a part of the diversity we experience as Canadians. I spend most of my days immersed in secular, legal, and educational institutions. They are a part of my own admittedly limited diversity. I'm grateful for them. I've been formed by these institutions. I deeply treasure them. I believe the insights generated by courts and legislations, legislatures and universities are very important resources for public action as long as we subject their pretensions to neutrality to critique as well. So I want to talk about these institutions. Courts are a significant venue for, answer, for advancing secular views in Canada, and they have triumphed in many respects because of the application of comparison and contrast. In fact, common law courts have long functioned through juxtaposition and vocabularies of comparison. That's the adversarial method in trial and appellate court uh, decisions. You compare and contrast different stories. You compare and contrast different accounts of law. It's a way of being aware of the dangers of a single story. As these contrasting stories are put into sharp relief, we get a testing and a critiquing of contrasting viewpoints, which in some ways can attenuate falsehoods, misperceptions and frivolous actions. Um, they create one way of even testing our own biases as we bring them into conversation with others. But it's not just the adversarial method that does this in the courts that we find value in. Uh, we find it in doctrinal matters too. Uh, constitutionally, we have federalism. Federalism is a system of comparison and contrast, putting stories together, uh, as we have to draw lines between jurisdictional boundaries, doctrines of double aspect paramountcy, interjurisdictional immunity. These are the kinds of tools that are used to advance public debate in bringing diverse perspectives together, how Quebec might differ on something than Ontario or British Columbia. Likewise, charter cases balance rights through comparison and contrast. Section one of the charter invites juxtaposition and weighing and balancing points of view. It includes evaluating whether a government action has a pressing and substantial legislative objective and whether such government action is proportional to its objective. This again is done through analogies and distinctions, comparing and contrasting rational connections, minimal impairments, social utilities. Courts have long used approaches which generate resources for action through juxtaposition. They don't need to add the extra label of secularism. The court's framework for dealing with Aboriginal and treaty rights also contains this same methodology, cautioning against the dangers of a single story. In a case called the Queen versus Band Van Der Piet, the court wrote, and I quote, the challenge of defining Aboriginal rights stems from the fact that their rights peculiar to the meeting of two vastly dissimilar legal cultures. There will always be a question, the court says, about which legal culture is to provide the vantage point from which rights are defined. And then the court goes on to answer its question, saying a morally and politically defensible conception of Aboriginal rights will incorporate both legal perspectives. This has led the court to find that while both common law and indigenous legal perspectives are helpful by way of analogy in Aboriginal and treaty rights cases, neither is determinative. Judgments are supposed to be made by drawing from each perspective and applying them in a way which best reconciles the interests of the parties involved. This creates, and the court uses this word, inter societal law. This creates an intersocietal story as views are compared and contrasted in ways that are consistent with Stendhal and uh, Taylor and Adichie's methods. Now as I've noted, it's not just law as a secular institution that gives us value in thinking about our diversity, but universities likewise have great value. We're 
deeply enriched by the secular nature of many universities. I see immense value in conducting research and teaching in an environment that's not required to advance any particular religious or secular point of view. These viewpoints are explored in hundreds of thousands of classes every year across our country. Peer-reviewed research and scholarship is also produced in significant quantities that produces insights for acting together. While not every classroom article or discipline is healthy in the way it engages with comparison, it's possible to see significant secular engagement across the country in our universities, colleges, and professional schools. And I want to keep that, even as I'm worried about this language of secularism as the neutral place from which to judge. But now I want to make another point about secularism, which is a little further critique. Uh, in my 25 years, very uh, as being a professor in different law schools across the country, uh, very few contemporary religious viewpoints have been explored in law schools. I even find that in other disciplines I'm a part of, political science, geography, history, and indigenous studies. Very rarely will you have a religious point of view be articulated in a university. I also find political perspectives on the right of the political spectrum are not strongly represented in the academic literature in the fields of which I'm a part. While religious viewpoints are by no means synonymous with conservative ideologies, there seems to be something missing when comparing and contrasting ideas in universities. While I would reject meaning I would not support proselytizing or partisan tests for faculty or student engagement in our universities. The meaningful exploration of religious feeling and experience from the perspective of people of faith is almost completely absent, and we're poorer as a result. The same, I'm making the point, is also generally true when it comes to political expression, which is not from the center or the left, in most institutions in which I have taught and visited. The failure to engage these kinds of diverse experiences diminishes collective action because it limits access to resources which could flow from them when they're placed into conversation with other traditions. Finally, religious uh, comparisons and contrasts. Religious institutions, I want to make the point, just like courts or universities, can also fail to draw out diversity in human experience, either by ignoring it or disparaging it in ways that we heard this morning. Now, while I strongly support freedom of religion and the rights of groups to believe and act in accordance with their own doctrinal and organizational goals, including not accepting or teaching other religious and secular viewpoints. I'm supportive of that freedom of religion. I think institutions of religion have the right to do that. But I worry when institutions withdraw themselves from learning and acting with others, their fellow citizens. While I do not believe religious organizations should be compelled to work with or learn from others, in line with ideas expressed in this talk, I would do all I can to persuade others about the value of religion and secular diversity. I believe comparison and contrast can advance spiritual, religious, and secular pursuits through intersocietal and interfaith, interfaith action, even as people hold dramatically different points of view. I think I've learned more in my life about my own beliefs, practices, and commitments when they're placed in contrast with others. I've learned more than I've ever done in insulating myself from other ways of viewing and living life. Now, fortunately, my experience is that there are significant indications that many people of faith have not isolated themselves from others and are alive to the complexity of their faith traditions and others around them. 
Um, I want to give some examples here. There are some 900,000 indigenous peoples in Canada who are Christian. For many indigenous Christians, comparison and contrast is a daily fact of life. We have experienced the tremendous gap between the real and the ideal in terms of how Christianity is presented and practiced. Residential school abuse, discrimination, belittling, and marginalization stand in contrast to Jesus' call to love one another. Many indigenous peoples also practice a Christianity which is syncretic, blending and combining the best of their religious and secular uh, traditions along with their spiritual traditions. Those who are not Christian in indigenous communities, traditionalists, can also practice in this comparing and contrasting ways as they embrace syncretism, as they make their teachings and practices live in today's world. There are also many indigenous peoples who reject religion and spirituality, but who nevertheless see powerful metaphors for public and private action in their own lives, which are drawn from those traditions. I also see the same thing, this use of comparison and contrast amongst indigenous people in Canada who are Muslim, Buddhist, Jewish, and adherents of other religious faiths. While there are fewer in numbers than uh, indigenous Christians, most indigenous peoples I've met who practice uh, their faith in these uh, environments uh, do so in a way that's alive to contrast and comparison. I'm going to do some self-critique here. Where I think indigenous peoples tend to be parochial, parochial and narrow is in our uh, affiliations related to our First Nations. There is a nationalism there. There's many reasons for that. There's a lot of health that can be attached to that because it's a protection against the overwhelming forces of colonialism. But like other communities, First Nations can pursue nationalism in a way that can be exceedingly inward-looking and dogmatic in its orientation and can be turned into another kind of single story that gets in the way of our ability to learn. Of course, First Nations are not alone in that. When you see what's happening in the United States and England and France, other countries where nationalism is on the rise. Um, so there are challenges and problems in First Nations communities on this front. But interestingly, in the field of indigenous religious engagement and spirituality more generally, I see a much broader engagement. The nationalism sometimes ends a little bit at the political, and there's this willingness to embrace, explore, compare, and contrast other religious traditions. Now, this broader way of viewing religion and spirituality is also something that attracts me to my faith. As mentioned, I am a Christian. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a Mormon. Uh, Mormon thought and practice also encourages us to draw insight from our diversity and find common cause with others in the public sphere. Uh, the current president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Thomas S. Monson, recently said, I would encourage all members of the church, wherever they may be, to show kindness and respect for all people everywhere. The world we live in is filled with diversity. We can and should demonstrate respect towards those whose beliefs are different from our own." End quote. One of President Monson's counselors in the First Presidency, Dieter Uchtdorf, echoed these sentiments. I quote, we honor and respect sincere souls from all religions, no matter where or when they lived, who have loved God. We embrace them as brothers and sisters, children of our Heavenly Father. He hears the prayers of the humble and sincere of every nation, tongue, and people. He grants insight to those who seek and honor him and are willing to obey his commandments." End quote. The past president of the LDS Church, Gordon Hinckley, made similar points. We must make an effort to accommodate diversity. We must work hard to build mutual respect 
an attitude of forbearance, with tolerance from one another, regardless of the doctrines and philosophies which we may espouse. Concerning these, you and I may disagree, but we can do so with respect and civility. And likewise, early church leaders espoused principles of interfaith engagement and respect. Orson F. Whitney said, God is using more than one people for the accomplishment of his great and marvelous work. The Latter-day Saints cannot do it all. It is too vast, too arduous for any one people. Thus, members of the church do not view fellow believers around the world as adversaries or competitors, but as partners in the many good causes in the world. One of the teachings I'm often attracted to is the keep all the good that you have and add this to what you're doing. In line with these principles, the LDS Church has sought to become more active in interfaith activities and humanitarian engagement in the public sphere. While there are still obstacles to overcome and further issues to address, as is the case with all organizations, I find great strength and insight from the encouragement we receive to engage with other people, both religious and secular, in meeting and ministering to the needs of others in the world in light of our broader diversity. So, in conclusion, our relations and our relationships are often more complex than we care to admit, and sometimes that complexity is within us. Canadians are not one people in the ethnic sense. Sometimes we're not even one people. If you look at the kaleidoscope of your life and its shifting identities. We must not look, overlook our multiple identities and inheritances. Nuance is sacred. Other religious and secular commitments can be enhanced if they're seen in this light. When I recognize my own views are partial, I acquire a key to self-understanding. It enables me to question and even overturn or revise my biases and work towards impartiality and greater fairness in being with others. My agency is activated when my own heretofore unarticulated choices are revealed because of the comparison and the contrast. You've probably heard this little saying before, a fish does not know about water until the first time it jumps into the air because what it's swimming in just seems natural and there's no re need or reason to be able to think about that environment in which you're a part. But when you jump into that air and you don't have the same tools, you recognize there's a thing called water because you see the contrast of the air. And that, in our own lives, activates our agency and, in my view, is a precious uh, gift from God and an opportunity for us as humans uh, to be humane and understand our complexities. The world is messier than claims to neutrality would allow. I think we should own up to this messiness. I don't think this label is helpful in terms of neutrality in their decision-making processes. Um, though I want to ensure that we pay attention to power and the imbalances in power in making our views more explicit. And I've tried to convey to you through federalism, charter jurisprudence, um, Aboriginal rights jurisprudence, uh, university practices, experiences around indigeneity, immigration, uh, uh, other uh, institutions and ways that we can deal with and find resources in our diversity without hiding them under neutrality's false label. We must acknowledge and work with our own imperfections, institutionally and individually. Uh, we can constrain, challenge, critique, and check our, our biases. We can do that. It's hard, but we can do that. Um, but we risk exacerbating those biases if we bury them under problematic frameworks or labels. Now, I've been speaking about comparison and contrasting stories on this realm. 
uh, I want to ensure that you also at least think about uh, the idea that uh, my view is that public life is not the measure of all things. We should not always be caught up in trying to analogize and compare what we do to university languages, legal languages, ethnic languages. There are other ways of engaging of which our faith traditions are a very uh, strong element. Um, so I do not want to make public life the measure of all things. Um, there's a leader of our church, Dallin H. Oaks. Um, he's a former Chicago Law School professor, a university president of Brigham Young University. He was a judge. He made this uh, statement. To be spiritually minded is to view and evaluate our experiences in terms of the enlarged perspective of eternity. There's something to be said for comparing and contrasting what we're doing here in this realm with what our views and our hopes are of other realms. My hope is that these resources that are present can create ways for us to more respectfully engage with one another. I want to conclude where I began, which is to talk about these seasonal principles because they have something to say about one eternal round. When I was uh, uh, young, I paid attention to these seasonal teachings and they helped me to um, recognize that the seasons that we see reflected in nature are analogous to the seasons that we often find in our lives. So when we're born in that springtime of our life, there's that gathering of energy that you're seeing outside as the buds start to come forward and the flow starts to happen in the rivers and there's this increase of growth and health and vitality. Uh, in that spring period of our life, we're like those little babies and children and we find a lot, and as Douglas was talking about, we need to do more to support the healthy springtimes of our children's lives in this country. Uh, but then we can move off and think about the summer um, when we're uh, young adults and adults as uh, new parents, and we've got this period of growth and vitality as there's a long season of harvest, as we work and we support and we sustain one another, you just think about what happens in summertime and you see what often happens in young adults and uh, young parents' lives as uh, they reap and take advantage of those long days of growth. There does come a season, though, when uh, fall sets in and the leaves start to change and uh, you find yourself uh, entering into another mode, a reflective mode, uh, as you want to um, sort of get comfortable and cozy and, um, and enjoy some of the benefits of what you've seen uh, go on before you in your life. And as you um, return to the earth, the values that you've received um, as a human being, you return to your children just as the leaves return nutrient, nutrients to the earth, you return to the next generations those kind of nutrients. And then there comes that period when we pass on, uh, as we're this late stage of our life, uh, often winter, um, elders are considered to be in the winter of their life, they have that uh, snow on their head, um, they have that uh, uh, accumulation of knowledge, and uh, there's this sense that a hibernation uh, eventually occurs, a death, um, a resting. Um, but as we know, uh, in seasonal rounds, the resting is not the end. A spring comes again. And many of us in our traditions have that hope of that bursting forth, that coming forward uh, in another way, whatever our various beliefs might be. And there's something about thinking about the seasons uh, which is also connected to thinking about comparison and contrast, not just being in this realm. And so this is what I learned in my youth. And then about four or five years ago in Minnesota, I got another insight to this as someone else shared their story of understanding the seasons, um, saying that our life 
is like that seasonal round, but our day can also be like that seasonal round. When you wake up in the morning, there's a springtime. It's time to gather together, to celebrate, to, as I talked about at the beginning of my talk, to appreciate the return of so much that comes when you're up in the morning and you're like that baby and you're ready to go. And then we're now in the summertime of our day, right? As we've had this opportunity to learn and grow and interact with one another, we felt the nourishment of uh, this time of our day. In a couple of hours, it'll be fall. Time to reflect, time to step back and take in the lessons that are a part of the spring and summer of our day and uh, return some of that if we can. Appreciation to our children, appreciation to our loved ones, appreciation to others that are around us that uh, they feel what happens in the fall. And then we go to sleep. And we're like those elders. We have a chance in that state to be able to gather together those insights in ways that are not linear. And in those ways be guided by what we learn as insights come in that fashion. This way of thinking about seasonality both across our life and in our day gives us reason to celebrate every day. It's a part of the comparison and the contrast that we can bring to our life. To again quote from Dallin H. Oaks, to be spiritually minded is to, a view, is to view and evaluate our experiences in terms of the enlarged perspective of eternity. I hope that we all find resources in our comparisons and contrasts. I look forward to continuing to learn from you, and I'm grateful for the time we've had here today. Miigwech bizindweg miyu ahau. Thank you. Now I feel to take some liberty between friends. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful and uh, compelling presentation on contrast and comparison. Now we have about 10 minutes for questions. So if you would like to, uh, and, and, we, and then I would like to pass the time back after about 10 minutes to the Reverend Dr. Hamilton to conclude this session. Um, but are you able to stay for a few minutes after if there's people that would like to come down and talk? Is that okay? I know that some of you have got to go on to other meetings, so why don't we do that? We'll end on time and then he can talk. So uh, and, yeah, why don't we, uh, okay, start. We, this gentleman here and then at the back, please. Yes. Well, thank you very, very much for your, your talk. I have a very uh, specific question. The role of faith communities in, or is it, is it, are faith communities compelled to translate their positions into sort of the language of the secular to appeal to reason? Um, I just wondered your view on that, and of course the critique of that is that if faith communities constantly have to do that, their own positions, which may be based on scripture or tradition, get so dumbed down that, I mean, it's just basically uh, uh, become secular discussion, not faith-based. So I just wonder how you, how you respond to that, uh, that puzzle. Yeah, I'd like to comment on uh, neutrality. I mean, I'm very attracted by your, your presentation. And I would love to have believe that um, in the justice system, uh, we could get rid of this notion of neutrality and that the uh, justice system could take account of various uh, faith beliefs, systems, various uh, different uh, cultures, and so on. Uh, but in fact, we have a situation, or we certainly have had, in which the power of a particular faith community is so much greater than that of all the others, whether it's the Catholic Church or the Pres uh, Presbyterian Church 
of Islam or Buddhism, um, that the idea of neutrality seems to me to be a second best. Because if you're allowing the justice system to reflect the, the uh, environment of the belief systems, you're going to get the, an overpowering uh, one belief system very often. Those are both wonderful questions, and, and thank you. I'll try to do my best to start to address them. Um, you and I are on the same page in terms of my concern about power and the way that uh, power can operate to marginalize uh, particular points of view, be they secular, spiritual, or religious. And uh, I guess the question becomes then, how do you deal with uh, that power? And there is an attractiveness to talking about neutrality because it seems to provide the uh, solution to the exercise of authority where one doesn't dominate over the other. Um, but I've tried to show that there's an alternative way to dealing with these uh, power imbalances which are found in the institutions and the doctrines that we already have in the courts. Uh, the uh, Section 1 analysis in Oaks, the federalism analysis, the Aboriginal rights analysis, the way we function in our universities. And the reason I worry uh, about the, um, the labeling and the use of neutrality, uh, in addition to what I've talked about, is um, the existence of heuristics and cognitive biases that are present in our, our rational so-called uh, ways of functioning. There's a, a wonderful book uh, uh, by, I think his name's Daniel, uh, Kahneman um, called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow and this book is it's a slow read uh, but he's a Nobel Prize winner in behavioral economics and he illustrates that we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're being rational when in fact uh, we're subjecting ourselves to all these cognitive biases. I know our other plenary speaker has talked a lot about the um, the di dictatorship of uh, rationality and uh, rationality itself is not something we can always depend upon. That there are other things that are embodied and embedded in the way that we function that need to be taken account of. Our emotions, our, as I'm expressing here, our religiosity. So we are sharing the same concern and then the question is whether or not the label of neutrality uh, gets us there when the court even says itself it's not possible in other instances, or whether the kinds of things or other things that you might suggest, or we might have another way even uh, to following that. Now, the second question has to do with uh, our faith commitments and whether or not uh, we're always compelled to translate them or whether uh, we can do justice by keeping them uh, in their context on their own. And in my view, we need to do both. Um, it's really important that we don't water down our ways of expressing ourselves and uh, always be melding them and manipulating them uh, to match someone else's language. That would be an erosion of who we feel we are in terms of our commitments. And uh, so I think we should do all we can to continue to develop those languages that are, are special and unique to our different groups. Um, but that does not mean it's not important to try to talk to other people about what our beliefs are and as best we can through languages of analogy, comparison and contrast, present a view where we might not get an overlap in that understanding, uh, but uh, can uh, give us a place to start to work towards that public action. And I, I worry about reason being the only way to do that. I think art is very powerful in bringing people into experiences of other uh, religious, secular, spiritual, but not religious uh, ways of proceeding. And what I find very interesting about what you've asked as a question is what I'm dealing with day to day in my life around indigenous issues. Indigenous peoples often ask, do we have to talk the language of Canadian law? Do we have to talk English? Do we have to translate and put our views into others' words? And it would be nice if that 
wasn't always required of indigenous peoples, particularly given the power and balance that's there and more needs to be done to revitalize and create resurgence around those ways of being in the world. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of folks living on our territory and there's a need for understanding about why it is we take some of the positions that we adopt. And even though it's always gonna be imperfect and uh, partial in the way that we reach across with those translations, they're better than, I believe, uh, the alternative. And not everyone needs to do both things. Some people can tend to just celebrating and developing and cultivating that language that's there in that place. Some people can devote themselves uh, to translation, and some people might be in that bridging place, walking back and forth between those two different worlds. <laughs>